starting around 1500 years ago, began a period of Kentucky's prehistory characterized by major changes to indigenous people's lifeways. First, people stopped making earthworks and engaging in long-distance exchange. Next, dramatic changes in projectile point technology marked the introduction of the bow and arrow. Lastly, the use of maize, aka corn, is evident in the Kentucky archaeological record. In this video, I flit nap a Levana point, one of the arrowhead styles made during this time, the late woodland period, and discuss how these changes altered Kentuckians' lives forever. To begin making my arrow point, I select a blocky piece of boil chert, a commonly used material in prehistory which occurs at the Kentucky knobs which border the bluegrass region. I remove several large flakes from this core, most of which are suitable for making arrow points, although I select the best of these and start removing large ridges, curves, and other inconsistencies from the shape of this blank. Kentucky's late woodland period spans from 500 to 1000 CE. The changes visible in the archaeological record which distinguish this 500 time period are spaced out temporally. The first major change is a halt in earthwork construction and a shift in mortuary practices to stone burial mounds and stone-lined box graves. Around the same time, interregional exchange networks involving exotic goods end. Despite this, widespread similarities in material culture and subsistence technology indicates that people engage in interregional exchange with neighboring groups. In essence, Late woodland communities reorganized how they interacted with each other and how they treated the dead, which previously had ties to interregional gatherings, rituals, and exchange. Rather than indicating a collapse in networks, this shift may indicate that interactions between groups was stabilizing during this time. With flake scars for many removals covering both faces of the piece of chert I'm working, it is now a biface. Styles of bifacial projectile points changed considerably over the late woodland period. During the very start of the period, expanding stem points like Low and Baker from the end of the middle woodland period were still in use. Due to the dramatic reduction in shoulder width while retaining similar characteristics to earlier spear thrower point styles like Snyder's and Copenna, some of the researchers think that point styles like Low were some of the first arrow point styles in this region. Gaining bow and arrow technology, people tried to adapt earlier styles of points to be compatible with arrow shafts, which were much shorter and lighter than spear thrower darts. However, by 600 CE, Smaller, dramatically thinner Jack's Reef and Raccoon side notched points are widely agreed to be some of the earliest true air points in the archaeological record of the southeast. These points were made from thin flake blanks and can exhibit deep dramatic notches for hafting to arrow shafts. A third innovation in air point technology, unnotched triangular arrowheads like Lavana and Hamilton are present during the late woodland period. While wider than styles to follow, triangular forms like Levana become the basis of arrowhead technology in the southeast, likely owing to how simple they are to make. The bow and arrow likely made hunting easier, as the process of firing an arrow is less likely to scare deer and is faster than launching a spear thrower dart. The bow and arrow wasn't just good at improving hunting success. While there isn't evidence for increased violence during the late woman period, the bow is much more suited to warfare than the spear thrower. Pottery during the late woodland period was largely similar to that from the middle woodland period, other than the lack of Hopewellian traits. Vessels were made in subconchoidal and subglobular shapes, with the most common decoration being cord marking. In the far western portion of Kentucky, Pan-shaped vessels and red surface treatments become visible in the archaeological record, and become more common in the following Mississippian time period. Settlement during the late woodland is complex, as it varies between regions and within these areas, and it changes from the beginning of the period to the end. The falls of the Ohio appear to have been somewhat of a cultural boundary in Kentucky 
during the late woodland, and settlement strategies upstream and downstream from this divide can be broadly characterized. Downstream from the falls of the Ohio, people shifted from nucleated settlements to smaller ones and placed less emphasis on floodplain locales during the start of the late woodland. There are exceptions to this, like the McGilligan Creek Village site, which was a substantial residential community. Towards the end of the late woodland period, settlements become larger and sometimes were built around mounds and plazas, showing signs of the Mississippian influence that would become the hallmark of the following time period. Upstream from the falls of the Ohio, village-sized sites sometimes included plazas and middens of varying shapes. Smaller residential sites, including both open-air sites and rye shelters, also occur. This variation may have been part of the same residential system, with people congregating in villages during the warmer months and separating into families or smaller groups during the late fall and winter times. Some larger village sites were located in floodplains which regularly flood in the winter, indicating people lived there only seasonally. Seasonally available faunal and botanical remains at these sites also support this pattern. This settlement strategy was observed among historic indigenous groups and is known as the Miami Potawatomi pattern. During the end of the late woodland period, settlements become smaller and this may reflect increased residential mobility. While I have largely used the two techniques in tandem, as the biface becomes thin, I gradually switch from striking off flakes using an antler baton to pressing them off using a smaller antler tool. The latter technique is called pressure flaking. While I cannot remove as much mass with this method, it does provide me with a great deal of control and allows me to precisely shape this arrowhead as it becomes smaller and more delicate. Late woodland stone tool technology is largely the same as from the former time period, other than the change in projectile point technology, including scrapers, drills, ground stone axes, and more. Non-nappable stone, like limestone and sandstone, was sometimes crudely flaked into agricultural implements, like hoe blades and picks. In western Kentucky, hoe blades are made out of Mill Creek chert from Illinois, and Dover chert from Tennessee. These chirts would continue to be widely circulated as agricultural implements across the broader region as time went on. The McGilligan Creek village site was a large late woodland village site dating to the earlier part of the period. The site is situated on a mesa-like promontory with cliffs that limit lines of approach. The residential structures are arranged around a central plaza, as evidenced by post hole features from what were once support beams. Other archaeological features at the site included hearths, a possible stone mound, and a well-developed midden of discarded artifacts. People at McGilligan Creek Village made low expanding stem points and cord marked pottery. Below the promontory that the site is set on, there are a total of 94 stone mounds in association with the settlement. Polished hoe resharpening flakes and seed remains of native cultigens combined with the extensive array of features indicate that extensive occupations at McGilligan Creek Village relied on starchy and oily seed crop cultivation for food. Another site in this region, the Fort Ridge site, has a complex of stoneworks that would limit approaches to the site. Similar defensive characteristics can be found at early late woodland sites in Illinois and Tennessee. Other than defensive site locations, there isn't evidence for increased conflict during this period, though these sites would suggest a real possibility that late woodland people perceived threats from outside their communities. The use of domesticated crops continued and intensified during the late woodland period, although it was still a supplement to hunting and foraging. Late woodland peoples grew crops that were part of the eastern agricultural complex, which included maygrass, sunflower, sumpweed, squash, gourds, goosefoot, and more. Wild plant foods that they foraged included nuts, fruits, and berries. Late woodland people hunted deer, small mammals, turtles, waterfowl, 
as well as bears and elk in the eastern part of the state, and engaged in fishing. Maize begins showing up in the archaeological record around 600 CE during the late woodland. Yet it wasn't towards the end of this period that maize appears to have been a significant portion of people's diets. Only in western Kentucky does it appear that people engaged in intensive maize agriculture during this period, becoming more of a staple across other Kentucky regions later on in time. Maize would revolutionize Kentuckians' lives, as true agricultural production with this crop allowed them to store food for lean times and have a surplus on hand, which would lead to more social complexity. With the shaping of the outline of this point complete, the final rounds of pressure flaking ensure a razor sharp edge and pointed tip. Small, triangular points like this allow archaeologists to identify the revolutionary introduction of the bow and arrow into the Kentucky archaeological record. This, and the introduction of maize agriculture, would set the stage for the final period of Kentucky prehistory by allowing people to create larger, stratified societies and defend their homes and food surplus from other groups. Overall, the late woodland period is a time of gradual, yet profound, social change in Kentucky archaeology.